uh, out there on the interwebs who, who are going to join us. So I'm going to take this time and make a few announcements. I know um, most of you grabbed a bulletin on your way in. If you did not get a chance to, uh, please grab one on your way out and you'll learn all about the stuff that's going on at the Historical Society these days. Um, uh, if anyone, um, uh, yeah, if you look through the, uh, if you grab a bulletin and look through there, you'll find my email address in there. It's programs at albemarlehistory.org. And we appreciate any comments you have about the program, any um, suggestions you have for future programs that we'll, uh, we offer. And for those out there in Facebook land, feel free to throw any comments in the comments section and any questions you might like to ask in our uh, Q&A uh, session at the end of uh, the presentation. And your name is? My name is Sterling, Sterling Howell. And the man behind the uh, Invisible Curtain is Tom Chapman. Uh, Tom's the executive director of the Historical Society. I'm the programs coordinator, and I'm uh, very happy to be with you this evening. Um, so yes, my announcements. So um, for upcoming programs we have, on October 13th at 6.30, we'll be at Northside Library, and we'll have uh, Hashim Davis, an Albemarle uh, High School history teacher, will be joining us to um, talk about teaching hard histories today. Um, so that should be very in interesting. Uh, on November 10th at 7.30 p.m., also at Northside Library, uh, we're going to have Dr. John Edward Mason um, talking about his visions of progress, portraits of dignity, style, and racial uplift, uh, a, photo a photography exhibi exhibition that showcases portraits that African Americans in Central Virginia commissioned from Charlottesville's Holsinger Studio during the first decades of the 20th century. And in December, on December 7th at 6.30, uh, back here at the center, we are going to have another speaker series with Dr. Catherine Coker. Uh, uh, Catherine Coker has just published a book called Virginia World War II POW Camps. It looks at the, uh, uh, the POW camps that were established here in Virginia during World War II and the thousands of German and Italian prisoners that were brought here and the effect they had on the larger community. So that should be fascinating as well. And uh, we got more coming in 2023, so uh, please stay tuned. Um, again, grab our newsletter. You can find us, you can check out our, our uh, website, find us on social media. Uh, we're all over the place. Um, and so I guess that's enough with the announcements. We looking good over there, Tom? Excellent. All right. Well, now I get to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, we are very excited to have Nancy Krauss with us this evening. Uh, Nancy is an independent historian specializing, specializing in architectural history and historic preservation. She successfully nominated numerous buildings and historic districts to the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places. The diverse list includes um, Curl's Neck, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, Curl's Neck Plantation in Henrico County, Grace Hospital, and Cary Court Park and Shop Center, both in Richmond, uh, Rokeby in King George County, Graves Mill in Madison County, the Norfolk and Western Railroad Historic District in Roanoke, large res residential historic district uh, nominations in Richmond, encompassing more than 2,000 primary historic resources um, uh, or including uh, Spring Hill, uh, Woodland Heights, and Forest Hill. While researching the history of these neighborhoods, she became interested in the 18th century canals and locks that bordered the south bank of the river, the subject of her forthcoming book, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, she is also author of Rose Hill Farmhouse, A History 1795 to two, <laughs> 2014. Uh, a native of Ohio, of Ohio, Nancy received a BA and an MA from Duke University, where she was a Ford Foundation scholar. A classically trained musician, she taught piano for 35 years and sang with a Richmond Symphony uh, Chorus for 20 years. She is married, the mother of three adult children, and the grandmother of four. Uh, tonight, she is speaking with us about the origins and history of Penn Park, with a focus on its earliest years. Uh, and we will end uh, with a Q&A. And if you like what you hear, you should check out the full-length article in our magazine of Albemarle Charlottesville History 
volume 79. If you are a member, you get one mailed to you, or you can stop by the Historical Society and purchase from, uh, me, uh, one from you yourself. Uh, and with that, with that um, thank you very much, Nancy. The floor My is yours. Pleasure. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I spent five long, arduous years um, figuring out the history of Penn Park. I didn't start looking for the history of Penn Park. It was a path that I had to go down in order to figure out Rose Hill Farmhouse. And I'll talk about, I won't talk too much about Rose Hill Farmhouse, but I'll explain how I got um, from Rose Hill Farmhouse to Penn Park. So the, oh, it's interesting the beginning when I started saying, I've got to figure out Penn Park or I'll never figure out Rose Hill Farmhouse that there were bits and pieces, none of which connected very well, about Penn Park. You all know the municipal park, I assume, with the golf course. And the, most of the literature suggested that Penn Park encompassed just that 400 acres on the Ravana River. That was actually the last piece of Penn Park to be put together. And it was accumulated over a period of seven, between 1770-ish and 1788 and was only owned over two centuries by two families, the Gilmers and the Cravens. So there, there was a lot of digging and a lot of family history that bit by bit the story began to come together and that's what I hope to share with you tonight. So my journey began here on Preston Avenue, this little house 1709 Preston Avenue, now 1218 Preston Avenue, changed addresses midway through its restoration, went on the market on New, in, uh, New Year's Eve um, 2013. And my very good friend from uh, high school days who lived on Deary Road called and said, you have to come see this old farmhouse. It's going to be torn down. So I called the realtor and I went and looked at it and I said, this should not be torn down. There's a history in this house. And I had just retired and I said, I'll buy it. And so <laughs> my friend said, you're crazy. And this is why she thought I was crazy. And when I look at the back, <laughs> I said, you're right, I was crazy. But you know, it was a cold January when I bought the house and I never looked at the back. <laughs> the front was bad enough. But just to set your mind at ease, and I'm not going to talk any more about Rose Hill, although I could talk all night about Rose Hill, every little detail. This is what it looks like Aww. today. So, <laughs> and it may be the oldest wood frame house in Charlottesville, Virginia. And if any of you know of a house before 1795, please let me know so I can correct my supposition. So, Penn Park began here. My house was part of Penn Park, the original two lots that started Penn Park. And th the, this house superimposed on a current picture is the uh, honeymoon cottage that Dr. George Gilmer built for his oldest daughter, Mildred, and her husband, William Wirt who was the fifth attorney, who became the fifth attorney general of the United States. And um, the deeds trace all the way back. The deeds are a pretty clean, clean march back through history. And so it was quite surprising to discover that this house related to Penn Park and um, William Wirt, and its history was completely unknown. I went through all of your local municipal records and other resources and simply couldn't find out much of the history, so that's when the search began. And just so you know, that gable roof is still in the attic underneath the roof that was put on around 1815, so today it's a hip roof. But the, and the stone foundation is in the front part of the house, but brick in the back, so you can see sort of a progression of development. So this was part of the beginning of Penn Park that was assembled by Dr. George Gilmer. And I couldn't find any photographs or old oil paintings of uh, George Gilmer, so um, this memorial is in the Penn Park Cemetery out in your municipal park. And he's most celebrated in most of the literature 
as a um, very zealous and outspoken leader in the revolution. He um, headed up the 11th Virginia Regiment. And so there are two different memorials celebrating his participation in the Revolutionary War. Um, who was he? He was the son, he, he was obviously an MD. He was the son of an MD, a Scottish immigrant who came to Williamsburg and then somehow managed to meet a gal from Albemarle County who lived at Castle Hill. So Gilmer was connected to Charlottesville through, or Albemarle County through his mother. His father died, sent him off to England to, or to Scotland to study medicine and while he was over there his father died. So when he came back he began to sell the properties that he inherited and there were quite a number. He was already quite a young uh, wealthy man. Um, just after he earned his MD degree. But he shows up in the, um, not very long after, in the 1760s, in the home of his uncle, uh, Dr. Thomas Walker. And that was um, Castle Hill. And it wasn't very long before he married Dr. Thomas Walker's, married his first cousin, Dr. Thomas Walker's oldest daughter. So he married Lucy in 1767 fairly certain he was pretty much in residence full time at that time and um, was a practicing MD, physician to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, also a really celebrated pharmacist. He had all kinds of um, formulas in a, in, a, in a book that he kept for different prescription uh, medicine, what we would consider to be prescription medicine. So he was very well trained in Scotland and um, quite celebrated um, for his medical skills here in Albemarle County. He also served as a magistrate um, in Albemarle County as sheriff. He was a representative in the House of Delegates and of course a, a very close friend of Thomas Jefferson. They seem to have enjoyed sharing literature together. So. Um, John P. Kennedy, who n knew close associates of William Wirt, the man who in addition to all of his other celebrated qualities, Dr. George Gilmer was also a literary scholar and had an enormous library that William Wirt used to great advantage. He became one of the greatest orators of his time. Um, <clears throat> very active um, in politics. So we see here the signature of Dr. George Gilmer. We know in 1766 he was at, Doc, at Castle Hill and witnessing documents um, that Dr. Thomas Walker was executing at that time. And what Dr. Thomas Walker was working on is this original plan, or very probably the first plan, of the town of Charlottesville, a block and grid pattern. It, they started working on this um, sometime after 1761 when Richard Randolph sold um, 1,200 acres to the Commonwealth of Virginia, who then in, entrusted it to Dr. Thomas Walker to establish the town of Charlottesville. So this block and grid rough sketch it was among Dr. Thomas Walker's papers at the special collections at UVA. By 1764, the plan had evolved and Dr. Gilmer's name is actually penciled in on two or three of these lots and we know from the deed books in Albemarle County that he did in fact purchase several lots. I suspect he was working closely with Dr. Thomas Walker and sort of had first dibs on claiming not just those lots but in just a second I'll explain what else he was looking at. Um, just for fun we'll look at a plan from 18, uh, 1818 how the plan evolved over time. This is the sort of stuff that historians get excited about and I find it fascinating to see how it went from this very rough sketch to something a bit more sophisticated with streets penciled in. What is of great interest to us, however, um, the, the 1,200 acres was divvied up into two sections. We had the block and grid plan 
for the town of Charlottesville. And then north and west of town, we had the outlots. And these ranged from 33 acres to 150 acres. And it looks like this in the surveyor's book. And then it looks like this superimposed on a contemporary map of Charlottesville. And it's probably not, is it legible enough that you can <coughs> kind of get a sense of where this, this block is? So of, my, of our interest tonight are the first probably the first two pieces that were put together of Penn Park. Outlet number nine, which is the um, n northernmost uh, lot, and outlot number 12. And we know from the deeds that George Gilmer purchased both of these lots. The two red dots represent the one on the left on outlot number nine is Rose Hill Farmhouse. And Outlot number 12 was the is the location of the Penn Park Mansion. So you can see those were contiguous and even con connected. I think the road that connected them was Westwood Road, but it's kind of, it, it, it can't be proved. It's just uh, based on the lay of the land and the later maps um, that seem to show a connection along Westwood Avenue between the properties. So it made sense for Dr. Gilmer to build the honeymoon cottage for his daughter and son-in-law on outlot number nine because he could parcel it off. We know from his will he started building the cottage in the spring of 1795 and he died in November. So he probably didn't finish it. There are letters from William Wirt to Thomas Jefferson as late as 1797 saying I need nails, 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 and he was ordering these huge quantities of nails. So I think Wirt probably was um, uh, charged with finishing his own abode. And then he only lived there for four years before his wife died. But in the meantime, when Dr. Gilmer died, Mildred and William Wirt went to court and petitioned the court to cut off her share of the estate. And Docu um, documents related to the estate of Dr. George Gilmer show that Wirt and Mildred were given, probably given that land, although there are no actual deeds for that, just documents in the inventory that came after uh, Dr. Gilmer's death. So um, I love these old maps, and this one's especially um, informative. You can see the blue boundaries represent Ro what would become Rose Hill, what was Rose Hill Farm in eight, by 1828. It actually was all assembled by 1812. But um, in 1828, Rose Hill Farm was gifted from one craven to, it, to his son. And um, when I first saw this map, I thought if Penn Park is Rose Hill, which is what it was called in the for most of the 20th century, then why isn't it in the boundaries of the farm? It didn't make any sense to me. So that was another, it was just one little clue after another that eventually allowed me to sort through this whole story. And you can see where Rose Hill Farmhouse and eventually the little red markings, um, that area morphed into what became called Kelly Town, starting in about 1868 um, when the Craven family began to sell off part of that lot. But you see the Penn Park Mansion this is actually present-day Westwood Circle, and if you take a drive around there, you can actually see how there was probably like a little circular driveway around the Penn Park Mansion. Um, and you, he, Penn Park, uh, when Dr. George Gilmer assembled it, was about 11 or 1,200 acres. By the time John Craven started um, expanding it. He owned uh, over 2,800 acres. So big, big amount of land from the Penn Park Mansion all the way to the Ravana River across McIntyre Park. It was a massive uh, property. So um, the deeds in the 19th century um, clearly show that the Penn Park Mansion and Rose Hill had contiguous boundaries and uh, Rose Hill Farm was only 332 acres of a much larger tract. So back to Penn Park, built around 1770, there are deeds in Williamsburg that identify that um, 
George Gilmer and his wife Lucy Walker were established in Penn Park at, around 1770. So I'm guessing both also based on the architecture, it's a pretty prototypical mid to late 18th century house with a very steeply pitched roof, the symmetrical gable and chimneys, the six over six double hung windows, the, the sloping front porch, um, often a raised uh, English style basement. These are all characteristics of architecture from that time. And it's a quintessential uh, house for 1770. And this is especially interesting to me. If you look at some really old photographs of Castle Hill, it has pretty much the same. It's been so added onto and enlarged that it's hard to see the original, but there are some very old sketches that are done of it, and it looks very much like that. It's larger scale, but it has the same symmetry and proportions massing as Dr. Gilmer's house. And the oldest son of Dr. Thomas Walker, who was George Gilmer's brother-in-law, um, built this, it was called the Old House at Belvoir, later called Maxwell, but look at the architectural style, how much it resembles the architectural style of the Penn Park Mansion. And this was built in 1764. So you, they, they, they may have even had the same builders, these brother-in-laws building their, their mansions. And just uh, so you maybe drive around now and then and pay attention to other similar houses, this one, Chestnut Ridge, which was also known as Darby's Folly and the Old Waddell Place, similar architectural style, built between 1750 and 1760. So you can see this is very typical of what was going on architecturally at this period. Another one, Wakefield, 1781. Styles start to change by the end of the 1780s and you start to have a more uh, softer roof lines and some other changes that go on. But for this period, Penn Park was definitely um, a, a typical of the time. So we know that Thomas Jefferson frequented Penn Park. He, when he was in France um, as the Ambassador, what was he? Secretary, I've forgotten what he was doing there, but he was in Paris for a period of time and he wrote to uh, George Gilmer and said he'd be very happy to eat at Penn Park, the good mutton and beef of the various pastures uh, related to um, Penn Park. I have no idea where Marrowbone, Horse Pasture, and Poison Field are. It would be interesting if, if that ever were uncovered. We know Thomas Jefferson's, all of his different fields were laid out and labeled, and we can find them, but unfortunately the documents for Dr. George Gilmer's various fields do not survive, at least not that I know of. This photo was taken in 1930 by a pretty famous uh, photographer in Albemarle County called Atchison Hench and it's from the Special Collections uh, Library uh, at the University of Virginia. You're going to be in for a big treat in just a little bit because um, a few weeks ago, I got a phone call from some residents here in Charlottesville who had just inherited house, a house off Rugby Road, and they said that the woman who had died was raised at Penn Park and that when she inherited that house, she and her sister inherited the house, they transported everything that remained in the Penn Park Mansion, this was in 1932, to the house on Winston Road. They stashed it all in the attic and the basement. And I have some treasures from Penn Park that belong to John H. Craven, and you will see a collection of photographs that the family took just before the house was torn down. So it's really, I found it so exciting, which is, it's such a wonderful thing for them to contact me and um, offer me some gifts from the Penn Park and the Rose Hill House. It probably went from Rose Hill to Penn Park, and I'll explain that in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, but at any rate, that's what it looked like. And um, this is what Thomas Jefferson had to say. And I think there was a literary connection here because we know that Dr. George Gilmer loved books and loved reading and was a literary scholar. And of course, we all know Thomas Jefferson was a master of virtually everything, including literature and books. And I think that's one of the reasons that they were very much bound together. And um, Jefferson said he was happy nowhere else in no other society. That's kind of a happy thought about Penn Park. 
So how did, what, what, what did it look like when it was all put together? So we've already talked about number one, which was outlet number nine, that's where Rose Hill was. Outlot number uh, 12, that's where Penn Park Mansion was. But Gilmer also managed to accumulate the key tract, the John Key tract, and um, that's where the mill was located. And then this group of uh, lots, 565 acres, that uh, were original patents to Charles Lynch that went through a very complicated history from owner to owner to owner and ended up being owned by the Harveys and were sold from the Harveys to um, Dr. George Gilmer. So this is, as best as I can tell, I'm happy for any corrections, this is what comprised the 1,100 acres of Gilmer's Penn Park. And based on um, the deeds and the patent maps, it's pretty actually was easier to map than I thought it would be. So Gilmer accumulated uh, about 2,600 acres in Albemarle County, but only 1,200 acres of it was on the east side of the, or west side of the Ravana River. The rest was on the other side of the river. And he did all that between 1770 and 1788. And I think it's important to acknowledge, um, in addition to his many gifts as a physician and uh, a pharmacist, he also accumulated a very great number of slaves who contributed a lot to his wealth. This is a page from the inventory um, that was compiled at his death. And um, the slaves were all listed. There are pages. I don't remember how many pages. If you're interested in this, um, I've transcribed all of the pages um, and sent them to the Historical Society in digital form so you could get them there if you wanted. But um, this is a page from Special Collections in Richmond at the State Library of Virginia. And it shows them all grouped and valued um, and then given away to each of his children. The same thing was done with his land. It was all parceled up, and there were lot numbers. It was lot one, two, three, four, but on, deeds only identify three and four. So uh, one of them is the lot for the mill, and the other one is the lot for the house and the surrounding acreage. And we really don't know, can't really trace how the rest of the land was dis distributed among his kids. There was a survey done in 1804, and um, the lots were all identified, but that document has been lost, so there's no way to know that for sure. So Gilmer died in 1795, and he is certainly m most celebrated in the literature for his service during the Revolutionary War. In Albemarle County, you celebrate him for other things as well. But um, in a national scale, it's his service in the cause of the revolution. And this is um, one of the memorial uh, tombstones that's still in the Penn Park Cemetery. And then his actual um, tombstone that's been through I have five or six pictures of it from 1972 to 1982, and it's finally cleaned up and at least stable against a wall. It's been really not, the cemetery has not been particularly well cared for. Um, so at any rate, now it's in pretty good, pretty good nick. So um, he's also, of course, remembered uh, to some extent as the husband of Lucy Walker and it, which brought him to Albemarle County and also as the father of nine children who have many heirs, some still around. So what happened to Penn Park? Well, in 1800, this man came to town. His name is John Huff Craven, and he was a Quaker from Pennsylvania, from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And um, the sixth of 18 children with the same mother and father, which I find amazing. And they all live to adulthood, if you can imagine. 18 pregnancies. I, no, I can't. That's <laughs> too much. But at any rate, he was a very vigorous and a really brilliant scientific farmer. And Thomas Jefferson heard about him. And he was getting ready to assume the presidency. And he wrote to his friend, George Mason. And George Mason said, contact my nephew. Stevens Thompson Mason, he's got this crackerjack scientific farmer, John H. Craven. And 
Jefferson invited him to Monticello, and one thing led to another, and he ended up coming to Albemarle County. And um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I introduce that this man assembled, end up purchasing all of uh, Penn Park, and almost twice as much after that of Albemarle County. He was, I think, hands down, the richest man in Albemarle County between probably about 1810 and 1845 when he died. His estate w went, I don't know all of Charlottesville very well, but there's a road where you get off the bypass, it's like St. Anne's, that was um, Meadow Creek Plantation. His land went all the way out there, all the way over to the river, across the river, and down to the boundaries of Charlottesville. Every, almost all the way to the university. So, I mean, it's a, it, it was a, a very, very large um, estate. And um, I'm hoping someday somebody will plot the boundaries of what John H. Craven managed to assemble. But he came to uh, Jefferson and went to manage Tufton Farm. And um, within the first year, he was so successful um, with his scientific farming that with fixed rent, he just began to make profit hand over fist on Jefferson's land. And he was so good um, and um, well recognized by Jefferson for his kindness to Jefferson's kids. He sent him food, he took care of any problems they had, that after t three years, he was on a five-year lease, Jefferson said, can we rewrite this lease? I want to keep you for nine years. He anticipated he would be uh, reelected president, and he wanted to keep Craven on. And he knew that Craven had already purchased a house, Rose Hill Farmhouse, uh, on Preston Avenue as his own personal house, which he was leasing to the clerk of the court. And so um, Jefferson nailed him down, you know, sealed the deal for nine more years and made a number of concessions. <coughs> Um, to, to, uh, in order to keep Craven at Tufton. So um, anyway, here's another portrait of John H. Craven, probably from middle age, maybe by the, about the time he moved to the Penn Park Mansion in 1817. Um, and Jefferson explains how Craven had been at Raspberry Plains, that's the farm of the, uh, Stevens Mason, and that he wasn't sure he liked the mountainous country here, but that he would come back, and so he did it about a year later. And in one year, in one year time, Craven produced so much produce that he sold Thomas Jefferson 209 pounds of beef, 1,000 pounds of pork, 1,100 pounds of fodder, and then began his buying binge of land in Albemarle County. By the end of the lease, Thomas Jefferson was paying John H. Craven. He, he no longer had a, a balance against when he bought, when he bought these, the beef and the fodder and whatever else he was buying, they would just subtract it from the rent that Craven owned him. But the last couple of years, there was, Jefferson was in debt to his tenant farmer. <laughs> it was really kind of sad, actually, when you think about it. So anyway, this is Jefferson's observation about Craven thinking too much of the Raspberry Plains to be happy with the mountainous country of Albemarle County. But although we have not come to an absolute engagement, yet he departs under expectation of deciding to return. And so he did on January 1st, 1800. And there's an interesting story when Craven arrived. He went right past um, John, uh, Randolph, the grandson, uh, Jefferson's son-in-law's house, and went right past Monticello, and his wife was nine months pregnant, and went straight to Tufton Farmhouse, and it wasn't finished. There were no windows, there was no plaster, there was no doors, there was a roof and a frame building. And he, Craven was obviously very upset, and um, Jefferson, these are in letters back and forth between Jefferson and um, uh, his, uh, son-in-law and said, make him happy, finish it, get it done. And he did. And he said, the interesting thing is that Craven's wife bore it all cheerfully and didn't mind having no windows or doors, <laughs> even though she delivered a baby a few weeks later. So it's kind of fun. Um, 
So anyway, Craven stayed at Tufton for nine years, but then moved to Rose Hill Farmhouse in 1809. And in 1811, he became good friends with James Dinsmore, who was like the head carpenter, an Irish carpenter at Monticello. And together, in partnership, they bought the Penn Park Mill and a lot of surrounding land. And this is the mutual assurance policy for the Park Mill. And you can see there was a merchant mill, three stories, one of stone and two of wood, a wing that was two stories high, and a sawmill. So when they say Park Mill, there was actually three mills on this property when Craven bought it in 1811. And it was lots three and four in the division of Dr. George Gilmer's estate. So <clears throat> apparently, it appears to me, between 1811, when uh, Craven and Dinsmore bought this property together, and 1817, um, when Craven bought Dinsmore out and took full, uh, full ownership of both the properties, both the mansion and the mill, that the house was neglected, and I'll explain that in just a minute. This is the only vestige of the mill that survived. This is an old photograph from about 1930, and um, this is on uh, Park Street where Rio comes down and Park and Rio sort of meet on the river. It was an antique store for a long time. That's the way some people remember it. But it's, I'll show you a different picture of it. It's been enlarged and changed. It looks, it's residential now. But this was what the, the vestige of that mill um, looked like then. <clears throat> when Craven <clears throat> bought out James Dinmore, he was giving an address to the Agricultural Society of Albemarle County and said, although the mansion house was much better than is usual on lands offered, the hall of the large house was without either glass, plastering, or paint. These with a dilapidated dairy and a wretched, few wretched Negro cabinets constituted the improvements. So it's pretty hard on his description of the Penn Park Mansion. This is what it looked like, I think, when it was still in very good condition around 1909. This is Susan Page Wills, who is a Craven descendant. And you can see the original house, which was fairly well maintained, um, probably by the family up until its demolition in 1932. And we can tell not only from this picture, but also from John H. Craven's will that Craven added a big two-story addition, which you can kind of see off onto the left side of the photograph. So in his buying bid, by 1821, Craven owned 240 acres, which was the Penn Park Mansion and the surrounding land, his own land. He owned 714 acres adjoining Charlottesville, that's Rose Hill Farmhouse, 31 and a quarter acres of his own land on Meadow Creek, and that eventually bloomed to hundreds of acres, and 393 acres on the north side of the Ravana River, and that's the Charles Lynch property that um, is also called Penn Park. This added to the confusion because both the land on the north side of the river he identified as Penn Park, and he also said his own land where he was living was Penn Park. And again, just to revisit, this is what it looks like. And I've identified, um, you see where Rose Hill is on outlot number nine and the Penn Park mansion, and then also the cemetery. And a house that was torn down that had been called Penn Park, but wasn't really the, the Penn Park, um, that was really the ho most well known as the Hotop um, house in the late uh, 19th century. And you can see where the Park Mill, Penn Park Mills were as well. By 1839, Craven owned nearly 2,900 acres, and some of these um, sites may be familiar to you. He owned Rose Hill Farm, Penn Park Farm, Meadow Creek Plantation, Franklin, Penn Park Mills, the Naylor Lands, which I think are on the east side of the river, the Key Tract, which was, um, there was another Key Tract on the east side of the river, and then a bunch of other tracts of land, hundreds of acres, that were identified only by acreage. So he's a very, <coughs> very wealthy man in, his, uh, at the, in the latter decades of his life. He also 
who incidentally seemed to maintain some sort of relationship with uh, Monticello, he served as one of the appraisers of Thomas Jefferson's estate. So he's very astute about, obviously, about pricing and furnishings and that sort of thing. And this is, uh, there are three portraits extant of, um, available, you can find them if you search, of John H. Craven. This was probably one of the ones that was taken in his later years. That first one that I showed you where he had that beautiful blue velour, that's ju I just, this is the first time I saw it last Saturday. That was in the stuff on Winston, from Winston Road. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the portraits that was still at the Penn Park Mansion that went directly to the house um, in 1932. And I bid on it. There was an auction, and I bid on it, but I didn't win. <laughs> it just got way over my head. So anyway, I would have liked to have had it, but at least I've got a digital image of it. So his epitaph is quite nice. I assume his family wrote it. Beneath this slab rest the last remains of one who died as he lived, an honest man. John H. Craven, born March 19, 1774, and died February 7, 1845. So I, again, his kids were very, very loyal to him. And um, there are also letters um, written by a couple of the carpenters at um, Monticello who just said he was just such a stand-up guy. He was so honest and he helped me whenever he could. So there's not much written about John H. Craven. There's a chapter in my book more they'll ever want to know about John H. Craven. But I've not really been able to find, uh, apart from what I've assembled, uh, it's, uh, I'm surprised he's not more celebrated um, for his role in the history of Albemarle County. So his family lived and occupied the Rose Hill House from the time of his death in 1845 all the way up to 1932, so a very long tenure in the house. When he died, he willed it to his second wife, Mary Lewis Craven, and she lived there until her death in 1852, and then some of the kids came back and moved in. And when my farmhouse got sold out of the family in 1867, uh, everyone that had been in Rose Hill Farmhouse moved to Penn Park, and there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a, there's some letters written where they were not very happy with each other, we'll put it that way that uh, whoever was there was happy there and didn't want these new people coming in. So these are the photographs that um, came from the private um, papers um, from Lucy Bird Wills Pego, uh, the woman that just recently died. And you see Lucy Bird and her sister Camilla um, posed against the brick um, chimney place and the big rear addition has already been torn down that was written on the back it said they've just torn down the rear addition um, so that's what it looked like just as it's uh, getting ready to torn down and another image of it gives you a much better view of the stone fireplace which suggests the house kind of evolved over time probably stone chimney first and then the brick added wonderful old images. <clears throat> and we end where we began at Rose Hill Farmhouse because I want to just very briefly end with a review of what survives. Um, certainly my house survives as part of the original Penn Park estate, teeny as it was, both the house and the land around it, 64 acres, but it was part of Penn Park. So that survives. The Penn Park Mill, you can see there's this big wood addition added, and somehow they bricked it or stoned in the end. The chimney was an exterior end, and now it's an interior end, so I can't quite figure that out, but it's de definitely the same building. Um, so the mill, a vestige of the mill that shows up on the insurance policy survives. And um, if anybody's really into investigation and research, I'm going to recommend somebody try to track down the history of the Lachlan Mills. You can see uh, the Lachlan Mills uh, up there. I've labeled it former Craven Whitehurst Mills. Um, and of course, you can see its relationship to the Park Craven Cochrane Mill. But there were some other mills that 
the vestiges of this may, these, this may survive. I just don't know, and I ran out of energy before I could track down the, the mill. And then, of course, the, pep, the, the cemetery survives. This is what it looked like in 1972. It was in really, really bad shape. It looks like there had been a flood, and it just kind of washed all the tombstones into piles. And then in 1982, it was very nicely, um, the stone walls were reconstructed and the brick was reconstructed. The tombstones have not been particularly well cared for. Um, in this image, John H. Cravens is up on pedestals and it's not, it's laying down on the ground now. Um, and it was when I visited there in 2015 or 14, I think. And of course, the last vestige of Penn Park is the Penn Park, <laughs> your municipal park. So um, that brings to a close what I had to say. I'm happy to entertain questions. I wonder if you would like to look at a few treasures, four or five treasures yeah. from the, yes? <laughs> okay, well the first one. I have an image of it, but I'm also gonna pass it around. This may have been, this is a shelf that, that Lucy, Berg, uh, Lucy Berg labeled that when it came from the Penn Park Mansion, and it was in John Craven's house, in, in, either in the Penn Park mansion, it may have been in my Rose Hill farmhouse, and then went to Penn Park. But at any rate, I think it's very curious and interesting. It may have been made by slaves, so that makes it really interesting. And then there's this really curious little scale. And if anybody knows anything about this, um, I would be delighted to know there are some really cool little teeny weights that are marked with grams little tiny square things. Yeah, I'm gonna be really careful and I hope you will be too. But it's, that was also labeled as something that came out of the Penn Park Mansion and I found myself curious to know if maybe it was Dr. George Gilmer's apothecary, but I don't think it's that old. It could be though, you just don't, I just don't know. So, oh, and the final thing that I was able to bring. I also have some chairs, some really cool chairs. I'll show you some pictures of those. But this was, a hand-woven wool blanket made at Rose Hill, or Penn Park, by slaves belonging to Lucy Bird's great-great-aunt Sue Craven. Sue Craven was John Huff Craven's daughter-in-law. She was married to George Washington Craven, and they owned and lived at Franklin Farm. And her slaves would have been inherited from John Huff Craven. And it's just interesting to look. It smells like mothballs, so if you're allergic to mothballs, don't, don't handle that. But the, the handwork is really quite, quite remarkable. So um, here's an image of that wonderful shelf that I just think is really cool. And I have a chair that has the same kind of pattern on the back of it. And so I think it could have been a sort of signature, you know, a hallmark of whoever made these beautiful items. And you see the, the little um, sign that was put on there to make sure that people knew what came from Penn Park. And the blanket. And this really cool Windsor chair. Now we know that John H. Craven's son, John D. Craven, attended the dispersal sale in 1826 of Thomas Jefferson's estate. And Thomas Jefferson had 142 Windsor chairs. Mm -hmm. And I find it hard to believe that a few of those weren't purchased by the Cravens. So this, this chair has green paint on it and it's been identified by a local expert who dates at 1800, which is about the year Thomas Jefferson bought um, his, some of his, Windsor, his first 20 Windsor chairs, and they all had green paint on them. So I think that's a really fun story, and that's in my bedroom, <laughs> my son's bedroom at home. <laughs> and that's one of the rocking chairs. I find it, um, rocking chairs are it's a sort of a thing of the past, but it's wonderful to uh, see that they, they, they had rocking chairs. Um, I've offered them to the Historical Society, in, uh, the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond, and if they d decide that they don't have room for them, they'll probably go on the front porch at Rose Hill, and you can come by and ha have a little rock. <laughs> I guess that's all the photographs. Thank you so very much for your time. <laughs> okay, I see hands, and uh, just, yes, questions. Yeah, that's, um, I will give a plug for the Historical Society here in Alamaro, Charlottesville. And Nancy. 
Can I just uh, repeat uh -oh. the question, please? Uh, uh, okay. the, que the question was, where does the name Penn Park come from? Yes. yes. Okay, so it's well detailed in this, but I can give you a short version. There were two v versions. One, that it came from Charles Lynch's wife, who was a Quaker and therefore would have been a devotee of, of Penn, William Penn, the founder of the state of Pennsylvania. But I think I've pretty much discounted that because George Gilmer's, um, it's, I'm not sure if it's his godfather, but sort of the equivalent of a godfather in Great Britain had an estate called Penn Park. And they named one of their, the Gilmers named one of their sons after that man. And so I think that it probably comes from the relationship between George Gilmer and this man in, in Great Britain. Yes. You know, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know how that cemetery ended up there. My best guess, and this is just a guess, is that there was some sort of a cemetery there before that Gilmer began to use after he purchased that last tract of land. And that was the last tract that he purchased. Now, there was a house there, and there's a picture of it in, in the article that was called Penn Park, and everyone assumed that that was Dr. George Gilmer's Penn Park mansion. That house burned to the ground about, I think it was 1920. You know where that was? It, yeah, it's labeled on the maps, which are also in this article. Um, it was, uh, so, hmm, I have to go back. I can show you exactly where it was. Let's just go back here. Okay, so do you see Franklin? Franklin, the property of George Washington Craven. So go north and west. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is, does this show? Yeah. There it is. See where it says Hotop? Penn Park? It's hard for us to read. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can find that here. Um, oh, here it is. See, see Hotop? And Penn Park, yeah. and that's the, that's the house that, bur that burned to the ground. And it was a big, I mean, even Ed Lay, who wrote the book on the architecture of Albemarle County, identified the house as mid-19th century. Well, George Gilmore was dead in 1795, so it couldn't have been his house. There was a little tiny cottage attached to it in the back, but that just seems too small to, it's more like a cabin seemed too small to be a Penn Park mansion. And besides, he was in Penn Park by 1770-ish, and he didn't buy that property till, till, I forgot the date, but it was later. It was way past the time that he would have already been settled at Penn Park. And there's another, in the article, there's a really interesting story. In George, George Gilmer's papers are at the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond. And one of the stories that he penned was that during the revolution, he was away, and his wife was entertaining, I think, someone from the General Assembly. And the British, Tarleton came and occupied her sister's house, which was the, the farm of the Lewis family. And she, her, the, the British came and shot, her guest decided to try to escape, and he jumped on a horse, and he was shot and carried off by Tarleton's men, and she got word back that he was a, that her house guest was alive at her sister-in-law's house. And so she made her way through downtown Charlottesville, pushing her way through the drunken British soldiers to get to her house guest, and Tarleton was so impressed with her bravery that he let her take the house guest back to her house to be taken care of by her own husband when he got home. And so if he was at clear up here, there's no way she could have walked through the village. Penn Park was, okay, so my house is right across from Rugby, and Penn Park was like right here. And so if she walked here to, um, I forgot the ex exact directions, but at any rate, if you look at a map where the farm is and where the Penn Park Mansion was on Westwood Circle, you'll see you go straight across town of Charlottesville. It's about one mile. So she walked about one mile. 
So that, I mean, since that came from the original documents, the original papers of George Gilmer, it seems like it has a pretty good ring of truth to it. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes. What's the address of your house? You keep referring to your house. Where? <laughs> 1218 What's Preston. the address of the house? Yeah, 1218 Preston Avenue. And if you're really interested in the whole history of Craven and not so, yeah, Penn Park is covered, but the whole history of Rose Hill Farmhouse, this is on Amazon. My commission is 66 cents. <laughs> so I didn't, I, didn't buy, I didn't write it to make money. I just am so interested in the history and the fact that it may be one of the, if not the oldest, one of the oldest wood frame houses in Charlottesville. And I hope someone who eventually buys it will love it and care for it and yeah. cherish it as much as I have because the history is really important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, do you know anything about the uh, Kelly Town and how that became Kelly Town? I do. And, and you uh, have and to buy my and book. And Tinsley, <laughs> and Tinsley Town, how it became Tinsley Town. Yes, those were two and of the. Robinson and the yes. property that Mrs. Robinson. Yes. The, it's, a, it's a fascinating story, and I'll tell you, I spent as much time on the Kelly family. So my house has only been home before me, three, basically three families. Right. Craven, um, you know, Wirt, Kelly. Craven, Kelly. And Kelly, Alexander Kelly was a freedman. How he came up with 240 bucks in 1867 is the great mystery to me. I have some theories about that. I think I lay them out in the book, I'm not sure. But um, he bought Rose Hill Farmhouse. The Craven's kids did not know how to run things the way dad had run them. And even though they were given huge estates and lots of slaves, they really fell on hard times after the Civil War. And so the, the grandson was charged with subdividing lots all along, Pres it was, at that time it was Barracks Road. He owned all the land from um, Shanks Creek, which is where McIntyre Road is, all the way, uh, a long way up uh, uh, Barracks Road. And they subdivided the, uh, the lots, five acre, mostly five acre lots, all along Preston Ave. Alexander Kelly bought the lot with my house and the name Rose Hill disappeared, and they started referring to the Penn Park Mansion as Rose Hill. And I think it was partly out of embarrassment that um, Kelly was the first black, Ameri black American to live in that area of really rich mansions. And um, his family owned the house for 140 years. And it's, it's a really fascinating story. He was the first man in Alamaro County to register his marriage. Uh, after it was uh, after emancipation, so it's a really I've found a lot of stuff about him, um, and he was a, just a farmer, and he farmed the land and took care of the house, and it's really a tribute to the Kelly family that the house has survived. Well, you know, I always wondered, I always thought that the reason there was this black group on that end of, what, of course, my father used to call it the cut. Yep. That was the nickname for it. Yep. Um, well, there were no takers for the lots, or th maybe there were some takers, but Ke Kelly was the first, and then several others um, bought lots uh, from that subdivision off of Rose, from Rose Hill Farm. And um, that little red area that I had cordoned off on one of the earliest maps that I showed you <coughs> is a cluster that were all purchased, sold to um, free. I'm sorry? No, they weren't. The, they're deeds of sales for all of them. And in fact, it was the, um, they. Kelly was the first, and someone I don't. I think it might have been Bob Vernon who said to me, "I think it was just because he was first. He was the first one to buy land, and that's why they called it Kelly Town, even though there were quite a few that subsequently came right after that, including Garland, who." There's a connection somehow between the Garland family and the Kelly family because um, Alexander Kelly subdivided off a little teeny piece of his portion of his lot to a, a um, Thomas Garland, who then built a house right next door. All of those houses were torn down and replaced in the 1940s and 50s along Preston Avenue. 
my house is the, uh, no, I take that back. There's one other house that survives, it's two it's doors. It's back in Tinsley That I don't know. I don't know about Tinsley Town. Do you know where Tinsley, you don't know about Tinsley Town? I know about Tinsley Town. I've read the history. Um, so Tinsley still lives there. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Somebody needs to write that history. <laughs> this is a good, th this gives a good start. It's yeah. a beginning and it incorporates some research from a local archaeologist who's a really great researcher. Can we buy the book tonight? Oh, no, you just have to go on Amazon. <laughs> if I had thought of it, I would have brought some copies, but it seemed too self promotional. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? What is the title of the book? Rose Hill Farmhouse. Yeah, just, yeah. No, just type it in at Amazon, it comes right up. Everybody in my family's bought it. I think those are the only people. <laughs> <laughs> we also have some questions for you from our online audience. Sure. Um, is the mill, Cochran's Mill, on Rye Road? Yes. A vestige a of vestige. vestige, because it was three mills. And I'm not sure when I look at that which of the descriptions fit what's on the insurance policy from 1811. Yes, and from um, uh, from Elizabeth, can you make your slideshow available? I'd be happy to. You want me to send yes. you a digital yes, send, send to you to the PowerPoint? We'll, we happy will make to it do available that. on a, um, on our social media. Yeah. Uh, similarly. Uh, Rosalind asked if you can make that list of, uh, of the enslaved people available as well. You have that. I sent it to Carrie. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And um, also John H. Cravens, there's an inventory of all John H. Cravens' slaves and an inventory of Gilmer's slaves, and that they're all many, many hours of transcription. <laughs> all digital, very easy to access and read. Labors of love. Um, and Lori asked, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, Craven was a Quaker. How did that, um, were there slaves working in property during his period? And how does, well, how does that it doesn't appear that he was a particularly religious man, <laughs> obviously. Um, his grandfather and his mother were Quakers and of Quaker roots. Um, and, but he was a, f maybe not a founding member, I think. He shows up as Craven of Penn Park in the Episcopal Church in downtown Charlottesville, the church that's still there today. So um, along with a lot of other big name aristocrats of that period. So I don't think he was particularly, obviously there's a disconnect there. <laughs> um, and you said your, your book is currently available on Amazon? Yes, yes it is. Uh, could you ex um, explain a little bit about the, the Hotop family? Oh, I didn't spend much time researching um, them. There is a lot of information on the Civilpedia, I think it is, about them. They started a brewery, a winery, a winery. And um, I think they owned that house. They were farmers and Germans, German immigrants, and they um, started a pretty, it, the winery became pretty famous because the wine was actually advertised in the Washington DC newspapers I found those oh, wow. but I've sort of forgotten about that because it was a little off the track of my research but there is plenty available about the hotops they, 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 they've been written about a lot and they advertised a lot so you can see a lot of ads that shed light on what they um, did <laughs> commercially do we have anything else out there Tom no, I mean, we were talking about the origins of Penn Park, so we threw a hotop question at you <laughs> a little bit afterwards, but that'll be up for like a next program, I guess. <laughs> um, but I did want to thank you very much, it's and we should probably check uh, the Amazon webpage because I'm assuming that there's probably a few purchases that have occurred during this talk. <laughs> we had about 40 or 50 people out there on Facebook, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I will say, though, in terms of the work that you've done with the transcriptions and looking at the enslaved communities, whether through Gilmore or Craven, um, that that information has also been the basis of some work that Sam Towler 
um, has been doing with us, um, along with some interns through UVA, oh, well, good. to try to document as much as possible um, these communities mm -hmm. so that we can make connections with the enslaved um, in descendants of these enslaved communities. So, and what happened to them? Um, yes, and what happened to them. And actually, there's a number of them, just as you're mentioning, you know, the Gilmer family have mm -hmm. connections here locally. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of them out there watching on Facebook wants to talk to you, so I sent you an email. <laughs> okay. Um, but also the enslaved communities, too. Um, the number of them that are still around in this area is the Tinsleys and the Kellys and mm -hmm. all those that yeah. um, tell the whole history. So, if there's any last questions, we'll get yes. one more. Yeah. You said earlier, I thought that Johnny's Craven was a Quaker. He was of Quaker roots. I should shouldn't have said that quite so strongly. Okay. I was his, how you're going to reconcile being a Quaker and his legacy. Yeah, his maternal grandfather was John Huff, okay. who emigra uh, uh, immigrated to Loudoun County from Pennsylvania. Although John's uh, immediate family stayed in Pennsylvania for a while, they eventually moved to Loudoun County. I assume when the grandfather died, because he was the surveyor for Lord Fairfax. It was the largest property owner in Virginia. So he's a big, I think he was probably a pretty big gun in Loudoun County. And um, I know there are a few uh, documents that show that Craven went regularly to Loudoun County, I assume, to help with family issues with 17 siblings. His youngest daughter, or his youngest sister, he brought to Albemarle County. And she married uh, William Whitehurst, who was Craven's partner in the P Penn Park Mills. That's, um, and there, there are some maps that show White, well, Whitehursts are in the uh, graveyard. There are a number of Whitehursts in the graveyard. And they show up on a couple of maps also. So they probably, my guess is that they, the house that was, um, in the municipal or near the municipal park that was the Hotop House. I think that was probably built by John H. Craven for his brother-in-law, for William Whitehurst. I think the Whitehurst lived there and maybe ran the mills in that Lachlan area. Um, all that needs to be researched, carefully researched. There's a lot, you know, it's oh, can of worms. <laughs> Yes. In your readings of George Gilmer, did he make reference to his neighbor, Amy Bullsfera, who owned this land? Is he, did he and Jefferson ever talk about her in their writings that you've seen? That does not ring a bell. Um, that's not to say it's in there, but um, I stayed fairly focused on, you know, pretty narrow range. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great. Yeah. And thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, like I said, if uh, you have any suggestions for us for future programs, you can email me. You can find my email in our newsletter. Um, this program has been brought to you by the Alvin Marshall School Historical Society and all our wonderful supporters out there. Thanks again, Nancy Krause, uh, for joining us this evening. That was a great presentation. And uh, I'm Sterling Howell. This is Tom Chapman. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. <laughs>